we're so close now everyone. Ballers Gate 3 is just around the corner, it's going to release in early access tomorrow and I've been preparing a lot for this, I've been studying up at least for D&D uh, 5th edition. Because D&D 5th edition is quite different from the things that we played previously. Of course, uh, most recently we played Ballers Gate 1 and Has Edition, which was D&D 2.5. And before that we played Pathfinder, which was... I mean it's Pathfinder, but it's essentially Dungeons & Dragons 3.5. And so in this video I wanted to highlight a lot of the differences between 3.5 and uh, D&D 5 and I also wanted to talk about how to min-max your character, how to create a, as good of a character as possible. Uh, one of the main differences between 3.5 and 5 that I could see is that in th the 3.5th edition, is in Pathfinder for instance, you have something called a base attack bonus, which means that whenever you progress one level on a fighter class, uh, which could be like a paladin, it could be a fighter, it could be a ranger, things like that. They will increase one, they will get one better on their base attack bonus. While uh, wizard classes, like mage classes, things that are more towards spell casting, have more utility than only fighting, these classes have a slower progression on their base attack bonus, which means that by higher levels, usually your spell casters can hardly hit. Uh, what this means is that on higher difficulties, on higher levels, even on early levels, that uh, your like mages and stuff like that won't be able to hit hardly anything, and th that will just become more and more noticeable uh, the more the game progresses, and the fighter will just uh, outpace everyone else in being able to hit something with a melee weapon. Uh, in this, in this edition, in fifth, that's how it works in 3.5. In the fifth edition, it's different. You don't have this base attack bonus. Instead, what you have is a proficiency bonus. This means that if you have a proficiency in a weapon, you get your proficiency bonus plus your ability score bonus on your attack roll. I'm gonna talk about all the ability scores and stuff like that. But this essentially means that everyone has the same what was previously called base attack bonus. A wizard is basically as good as hitting stuff as a warrior, but then of course warrior has other feats and stuff that make them better in melee. Uh, but this makes quite a difference in how you approach this, because previously in 3.5 it meant that uh, classes that were kind of, uh, how should I say, they were kind of a mix between utility and fighting prowess, those classes were very very hard to utilize. Because essentially you couldn't use the fighting prowess at all, on at least on hard difficulties. I'm talking Pathfinder, hard difficulties now. Uh, you weren't able to utilize your fighting ability at all because your base attack bonus was so shy. But now that you have a proficiency bonus instead, it makes that essentially every class can fight, which is kind of cool. So uh, that's the first big, big difference. Uh, then we get into attributes. So I said attributes. I meant ability scores. To be fair, in Ballers Kid 1 and 2, it's called attributes, but it's called ability scores in 5th edition. Okay, okay, okay. They're, they're still the same though. Strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. And you can have up to 18 in this. 10 is the baseline. That's like normal level, normal level strength, normal level dexterity, and so on. And then in increments of 2 you get extra modifiers, so there's no use in having like 13 in 13 in strength for as far as your modifiers are concerned. There might be ability checks, and there's probably, if I know Larian Studios correctly, there's going to be a lot of ability checks. You probably want to have, you know, someone maxed out in every one of these uh, just to pass these ability checks. But for your modifiers, it doesn't matter if you have 13. Uh, strength because it's going to be the same as if you have 12 strength, but if you have 14 strength you get plus an extra plus on your modifier So hopefully I will put up the modifier table here or else I forgot about it and uh, I look like a fool <laughs> Anyways another important difference. Oh, that's not different. That, that, that actually works the same But an important difference here is actually with finesse weapons I'm gonna talk about finesse weapons before I co uh, continue with ability scores. So what are finesse weapons? You might remember these from uh, when we played Pathfinder. So finesse weapons are weapons that are based on your dexterity instead of your strength. Normally when you use a melee weapon, it's used on your, it's based on your strength. And when you use a ranged weapon, it's based on your dexterity. But then there are certain melee weapons which have the property called finesse weapon. And when you have a finesse weapon, you use your dexterity instead of your strength. And before this, these weapons were not super good, I wouldn't say. Or a bit, yeah, I mean, you can make them work, but the thing is, 
it was often easier to just go with strength because you added both you got both got a bonus to your attack roll and to your damage roll. So you got extra damage and you got extra attack. Okay, so before how it worked with a finesse weapon, you had when you had a finesse weapon is that you added your dexterity modifier instead of your strength modifier on your attack roll, but not on your damage roll. So that meant that you also needed strength even if you were a finesse character. There were ways, of course, of getting around this, but for the lower levels at least, that's how it worked. Um, but now how it works if you have a finesse weapon is that you add your dexterity modifier both on your damage roll and on your to hit roll, which means that you don't need strength at all on your dex based characters, which means that dexterity is very good because it also, of course, affects your armor class. We're gonna go through the ability scores soon, but first I just wanted to explain to you how attacks work. Okay, so when you attack a character, you have... you attack their armor class. If you, have a, if you have an attack, you can also attack their DC, but that's when we get to spells. So first of all, you attack their armor class. You want to roll over their armor class with a d20. Then you add your modifiers. First you add your proficiency modifier. This is going to be the same for every class, so it doesn't matter really what choices you made. It's going to be based on your level. So the first four level you're going to have plus two, and then you're going to have plus four, and so on and so on. And it's going to increase every fourth level. Then you're also going to add in the relevant modifier from your attribute. So if you're attacking in with a strength based weapon, that's going to be your strength and you're going to uh, check your modifier and you're going to add in that. Then you can also have a advantage or a disadvantage. <laughs> what is an advantage and a disadvantage? Well, if you have the advantage, you roll two d20s instead of one and then you pick the highest roll. If you have the disadvantage, you do the opposite, you pick the lowest roll. Uh, there are abilities and skills and stuff and situations which make you either have the advantage or not have the advantage. So of course that's also going to affect a lot. Uh, so that's how you roll. So you want to have a, as high as possible in the main stat. If you're a fighter for instance, and you're, if you're a strength based fighter, you want your strength to be as high as possible. Because that's going to be your most important role uh, with your character. So, that's how the attack roll works. Okay, so now we finally get to the ability scores. There was a lot to cover <laughs> to get there, but now we're finally here. Okay, so there's strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. And we start off with strength there. We've already talked about that strength. You add the modifier from your strength on your attack roll, and you add it on your damage roll for a normal melee weapon. Of course, if you have finesse, you can go for uh, dexterity instead. Strength also measures how strong you are, so it might be used in dialogue options, and it's also how much you can carry. But except for that, it doesn't do much. So if you have a finesse warrior, and it might not be too difficult to find finesse weapons, you can essentially dump strength. <laughs> Weirdly as that sounds, because it doesn't do anything for you. Uh, from a min-maxer's perspective, of course, if you're a role player, you want your characters to be a little bit strong. But now, we're talking from min-maxing uh, standpoint here. Then we get to dexterity. Dexterity... Uh, has a lot of things. It's very, very strong. So first of all, of course, if you're wielding a finesse weapon, you add it to your damage, you add it to your attack roll, and also you add it to your armor class. But then you also add it to your initiative. So uh, you add it to your armor class, uh, but you don't add it to your armor class if you're wearing a heavy armor. So now, I guess we get to the first discussion here. Why should you use strength over dexterity? Is there any use in using strength, it seems like the dexterity is just superior because you only need to invest in one stat and that's much easier because then you can pick up other useful stats. Uh, so why should you go with strength? Okay, so there's a couple of options when you get to weapons. So first of all, you can wear a, wear, wear, you can carry a one-handed weapon, two one-handed weapons or a two-handed weapon. If you're wearing a two-handed weapon, those weapons are normally not allowed to be Finesse weapons. There might be a, such a weapon in this game, who knows? It's just a 200 finesse weapons, but normally there are, there shouldn't be 200 finesse weapons. Uh, and of course, 200 weapons deal more damage. If you have two 100 weapons, on the other hand, you will be able to attack with both of them. Only if you're a fighter and a ranger, you will have access to a feat, which we're gonna talk about way later. <laughs> Which is called two weapon fighting as it so happens and this makes it so that normally when you make attack with uh, two, uh, two one handed weapons the first one will add your damage roll you will, you will get your attack roll of course the bonus from dexterity or strength depending on if it's a finesse weapon or not and uh, It will also add the damage modifier if you don't have two weapon fighting on the second attack Which is done instead of doing a bonus action. You're skipping out on your bonus action. That is to do that attack uh, 
you will not add the damage roll. Unless you have two weapon fighting, which can be added by the ranger or the fighter. Okay, so I guess we also have to go through actions. It's kind of a complicated game, I guess. But we have to understand the actions to understand what we're missing out on here, okay? So first of all, actions. There's three main types that I want to talk about. First of all, there's movement. That's how far you move. Does not depend on what class you select. Doesn't matter if you're a mage or if you're a warrior. You will move the same amount, same range. It's the same for a build score. It doesn't matter if you have very high strength or dexterity or something. It doesn't affect uh, how far you move. There are, of course, things which affect how far you move. For instance, we saw the ability called an action that is called called dash that we've already seen in one of the gameplay that's also behind me now. Uh, we've seen how. Uh, you can dash to get double movement, for instance, but then you wasted your action. Okay, so you can do every turn, you can do your movement, you can do your action, which could be, for instance, you can attack, you can cast a spell. Uh, also, jumping, from what I've seen, is movement, uh, but there are jumping abilities which are actions. <laughs> okay, hardly complicated at all. Then you have bonus actions, and bonus actions are things that can use if it's allowed to be used, for instance, if you have an attack with a one-handed weapon, you will get the bonus action, which can either be that you attack with a spell, uh, it can be that you attack with a... Uh, not any spell, it will be a spell which has the casting time, of course, of one bonus action. It can be that you attack with your offhand weapon, <laughs> yes, this hand. Uh, or it can be that you use a class feature, we don't know exactly which class features are going to be implemented yet in the game, so it's going to be a little bit difficult to judge exactly how useful these bonus actions are gonna be and depending on how useful they're gonna be that might also determine what uh, weapons or what stuff we want to have and how do you want to have a two-hander want to have two one-handers or one one-hander for instance so from the looks of it it seems like using a finesse weapon two of them seems to be the best choice right now because we haven't seen many spells revealed that uh, have the casting time of one bonus action, but it might be revealed in the future. So that's what seems to be best right now. Anyways, let's continue with the ability scores. Okay, so we've gotten through strength and dexterity. I think that's the most complicated part. Okay, so dexterity we've already concluded. It's very good. It's probably what I'm gonna go with in, in my first build. Probably gonna try at least. Finesse weapons, dual building and see if that works out. Anyways, now we get the constitution. Constitution is much simpler. Whenever you level up in this game, you will get a amount of hit points depending on your class. You will, at first level, you get the maximum amount for your class. So, for instance, if you're a wizard, that's a d6. So, instead of rolling a d6, you're just gonna take 6. And then you're gonna add what? You're gonna add your constitution modifier. So, your constitution modifier, for instance, if you have 18, is gonna be plus 4. So, you get 10 HP on your level 1 wizard with 18 constitution. Very, very simple. If you're another class, for instance, if you are a fighter, you're gonna have 10 instead of uh, the d6 from a wizard. If you're a barbarian, it's gonna be 12. Uh, the barbarian is not initially gonna be in uh, Baldur's Gate 3, but it's going to be ported in later, from what I understand. So, in the early access, that is. So, that's very simple. Then, when you level up later on, it's a little bit more complicated, because you don't get the maximum of your hit die. You get the average... I, okay, you select either the highest average, which on a d6, if you take the, for instance, the wizard, is going to be 4, of course. Uh, it's 3.5 is the average roll of a d6, rounded up, which is 4. Or uh, you take uh, what you roll on a d6. And then, of course, you add the constitution modifier on top of that. So on the first level, you get a little bit more HP. On the consequent le levels, you get a little bit less HP. Unless you're, I guess, very, very lucky with your rolls, and you only roll 6s, then fine. Uh, and are you constitution modifiers? Constitution, mod uh, constitution is useful on every class. It's the same with dexterity because it add your armor class. I guess if you have a heavy plate that uh, doesn't allow your dexterity modifier, it's not going to be useful. But it's going to be useful on all mages and stuff like that. Things that aren't wearing the heaviest of armors. Because mages, of course, can't cast spells in heavy armor. Um, so instead, they will rely on the dexterity modifier plus whatever they get from their robes or whatever they're wearing. And... Of course, same with like bards and rogues and stuff like that, and usually wear uh, lighter armors. Okay, so next we get into intelligence. And to understand intelligence, wisdom, and charisma, I think we need to understand DC. So we've talked about AC, that is armor class. We've talked about the, how the attack roll works. You have your proficiency bonus plus your modifier bonus from the weapon that you're attacking with. When you're attacking with a spell, you're attacking different 
things depends on what the spell says, right? Uh, how how it's used. There are also spells, of course, which are all, also used in attack roll, but we're gonna, not gonna talk about that yet. Uh, might get to that later. So in the DC case, you don't add, a, you don't get a proficiency bonus, but you get a bonus from the attribute, main attribute for that class. So for instance, intelligence is the main attribute for the wizard, which means that if you have a uh, intelligence, let's say of 18, which is the highest you can get. If you don't have a racial bonus, we can talk about races also later on. <laughs> you will add plus four on your spell. Then you're gonna add a d20, of course, that you roll, and then you're gonna overcome something. It depends on what the spell says that you need to overcome uh, that you roll against. So it's of course very good to have as high of a modifier as possible uh, if you're a wizard. So that's intelligence. You also get a bonus of lore checks. I don't know how useful that's gonna be in the game, so we're mostly gonna focus on combat here. So next we get the wisdom, which is actually also very simple. So we've already talked about intelligence and how you add the modifier from your intelligence to your wizard's DC when it casts spells against an enemy. Now when you are a cleric or when you're a druid, you will add your wisdom instead. So it's that simple. It's like the intelligence of clerics and druids. Easily put. Charisma is the same thing for warlocks. And paladins, but paladins are not in the game yet, but they're gonna, you know, get into the game at some point. Uh, charisma also affects how easily or how much you can uh, talk your way out of situations. I think charisma is actually gonna be quite, even though it's not super good from a uh, combat perspective, I think it's gonna be quite useful in these type of games where there's a lot of dialogue and stuff like that. Okay, so now we finally get to the fun part, min-maxing ability scores. But, of course, to understand min-maxing ability scores, we need to understand races. Hopefully I will put up all the races that we know are gonna be available in Ballas Gate somewhere here, else I look like a fool again, and that's fine. So, the races come in two varieties, I, one could say. Either you get plus two, to an ability score or you get plus one. Getting two to an ability score is much, much better because if you get plus two to an ability score, it will be enough to push it up to the level where you get another plus one to a modifier, which is much, much better, of course. So, what things are we gonna dump? What things are we gonna increase? Well, in most cases, we'll probably be able to max out three ability scores and we can essentially dump most other things and it will depend on our own preferences what other things we keep. So. Uh, let's say, for instance, that we're a wizard. If you're a wizard, we want to max out intelligence, and we probably want to add a race which has a plus two bonus to intelligence, if it exists. I don't remember if it existed in the races. If you have a plus two bonus to intelligence, you will get that plus five on your modifiers when you make a spell roll against something, which is very, very useful. Let's say, for instance, that you are a warlock. Then you probably want to max out your charisma. You want to have a class which has a plus two to charisma, so you get plus five on the rolls for the warlock. And then what do you do afterwards? Yeah, you probably in most classes you want to go with your main attribute, then dexterity and constitution, because dexterity and constitution is useful for everything. Constitution is useful for everyone. You probably always want to max out that. And then lastly, Dexterity is going to be useful for everything that is not wearing heavy plate mail. Because of course, if you're wearing heavy plate mail, you don't get the dexterity bonus, so you might not need it. Uh, but you are still going to get the initiative bonus. So that's something to keep in mind. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to max out your main stat, which is used for your attacks or your spells. Then max out dex or constitution, and then use a class which enhances the ability score of your main attribute. Okay, so we've talked about the ability scores, we've talked about races, but we have not talked about the classes yet. So I'm gonna assume here that we're playing this as your main character, and I'm gonna give you some pros and cons uh, for and against different classes, so we're gonna go through them one by one. So, in early access there's going to be the cleric, the fighter, the ranger, the rogue, the warlock, and the wizard. So let's start off with the cleric. The cleric is wisdom based, we've already talked about attributes, and uh, his spells are often focused on healing and buffing your party. They're often very weak on lower levels, but they get stronger as the game progresses. But the wizard is always going to have the upper hand, but the spell casting list, the spells that I can select from, is also going to be different. The wizard selects from arcane spell casting, and the cleric selects from divine spell casting, which means he can wear heavy armor or any armor while he's casting spells, while the wizard can't. The cleric is more of a 
can be a frontliner, can have like a mace and a plate armor attack and sometimes cast a heal or something like that. But since it's weaker on lower levels and since it's more party based, I don't want that to be my first character because initially I'm not, not maybe going to be able to utilize his spells completely. Next up is the fighter. And there's a good argument for having your, a fighter be your main character and that is that you can allocate your attribute points uh, or your ability scores, I mean, <laughs> exactly how you want. Which is very, very crucial for a fighter because you want to have maxed out whatever your main stat is. Usually in these games, like if I look at like Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, and when we played um, Pathfinder Kingmaker, for instance, usually your companions are not well, I mean, their stats are not well allocated. So when you can allocate the stats very well, we can have a high dexterity, for instance, high constitution, maybe for a two handed fighter, you can have a high strength also. Uh, then you can create a really really strong character. So that's the argument for the fighter. The fighter compared to other classes, why he's so good at fighting, because he doesn't get a better base attack bonus that we talked about before than other classes, is that he gets extra attacks. And he also gets extra feats and stuff like that, which has to do with fighting. Next up is the ranger. Uh, the ranger is similar, in, in one way is kind of similar to the fighter, it feels a similar role, but the ranger is more focused at least lore-wise, on shooting, but the fighter can shoot essentially as good as a ranger, but the ranger has one upside on the fighter, one big upside, because he doesn't get the extra attacks as the fighter does. Uh, and it's that he can have a uh, favored enemy, and the favored enemy he gets bonus on his attack rolls and damage rolls, and it can be quite a substantial bonus. If you know that you are gonna hunt, for instance, mind flayers or something in this game, and you want a really big bonus, you want to be really good at taking out mind flayers, then you can have a ranger with a favored enemy, mind flayers for instance, and that bonus will be in most cases higher so that he will deal more damage against that particular enemy than the fighter, but in all other cases the fighter will be stronger against uh, most enemies in melee that is. Okay, next up we have the rogue. The rogue is also meant to often go into melee and the idea behind the rogue is that he has a sneak attack which can do if he attacks someone uh, unseen and the thing with the sneak attack is that you only get one sneak attack so you only get one sneak attack per round that will be a turn uh, when per turn in this game and let's say you have two daggers if you miss with one dagger you have still have your uh, your other attack that you can do with the other dagger and if that hits, you will still get off your sneak attack. But if you miss, if let's say you have a two-handed weapon and you miss, then your uh, sneak attack will be wasted for that turn. You can't get that off. So it's very important for the rogue to get the sneak attack off, because that's how we get a lot of damage. The rogue can deal the most damage of uh, the fighter, the ranger. It can do deal the most damage of all, but it's very dependent on getting off that sneak attack. If it doesn't get off the sneak attack, He's not as good as, he's not as durable as the fighter, he doesn't have as many attacks as the fighter, he doesn't have as good options for uh, feats and stuff as the fighter, so it's all about um, sneak attack in combat that is. You, of course you can use things such as lock picking, you can uh, uh, sneak and stuff like that, that's uh, other things you can do with the rogue, but if you're talking combat. Uh, so a uh, rogue I think is a pretty good thing to pick up or a pretty good thing to have as your main character because if you have a rogue as your main character uh, then you might be able to sneak past different places, maybe open some locks, maybe get some early equipment and stuff like that. So there's an argument for actually picking up rogue I would say as your main character. Lastly we get to the warlock and the wizard. So the warlock and the wizards are both arcane spell casters but they have a different selection of spells. The wizard has more spells that they can select from than the warlock. Uh, but the Warlock uses Charisma instead of Intelligence, which is often very useful, because you can often use the Charisma to persuade other characters uh, and stuff like that. So uh, the Warlock is often focused a little bit more on damage, and I think the Warlock can be a really good choice as your main character, because you're probably going to be talking a lot with that main character, so having uh, being able to pass like intimidation checks and stuff like that with the Warlock can be really good. But now at the same time, I think the Wizard can also be really good, because the Wizard has a large selection of spells, and often these... Uh, Larian Studios like Divinity Games are very toolboxy games where like if you have the perfect tool uh, you can get through any situation. I think the wizard could be also a really good choice. So that is my guide for everything we know about Baldur's Gate 3 and how to min-max and everything. Thanks so much for watching everyone and see you in Baldur's Gate 3.
Hey everyone, I'm back again with another genius member shout out actually. Member shout out. Member member shout out. <laughs> thank you everyone so much for watching. A special thank of course to all our members on the Patreons and on the YouTubes. Uh, if you also want to become a member, by the way, check out the join button next to the subscribe button or check out my Patreon, link in the description. Thank you so much too! Adam Alexis, Simon Lauer, Rodney Cox, The Soft Pillow, Nathaniel Nissan, Laser Set Stun, Michael W, Topless Investments, Peter Gold, Sean Stevens, Gabriel Jubilo, Wayne, Messamuk One, Ye Old Bastards, Tai Tai, Eli Moonlight Sock, Rachel 2000, Rassi Fart, Invoke Legion, John Dominion, Gesasaki, Own77, Ellie Curtis, Noah VH, MC Hermes, Fumiaki Kinoshita, J Cap, Steve Gaminskis, Kyrus of Zero, Tim Dutton, Jake Danley, The McDunkin, Relegan, Chase Close, Hansa Cost, Agony Reborn, Ramen News, for me, Netherbex, Musketeer, Name the Epithet, Dear Lurgog, Dimlet Nike, Stricker Mike, Huan Tu Ying, Channel of Fatal Load, Adam Nixon, Ninja Astral, Optimus, Poki Yu, Medic Pistol Man, Seppi 1310, Martin Newman, Catherine Loiskel, That's Mr. Gotti Yu, Jake Palmer, Thomas Schwartz, Kyle Hoff, Yuri Robinson, Robert Montgomery, Salem Proctor, Zach Coyle, QGL889, Some Call Me George, Paris Hammond, Bill Murray, Kyle Wedgwood, Patrona Bavaria, Robert Barker, Adam Jacob, Fernando Visu, Robert Lewis, Dr. Leos, Santa John, Geek, General Educator, Embracer of Knowledge, Joseph Suninga, Nate TMI, Shamanix, <laughs> Matthias Porlet, DJ X Disorder, Carlos Ardines, Simon Fairley, Ivan Miller, William Cunningham, Kevin Yunye, Juan, Limilainson, John Sillier, Silver, AD Sibriosis, Yuri Lepikov, Isabel Nemi Lindfors, DJ D Star in the mix, Link is Week, Verokta, Dan Goodsell, Aaron Noble, Drew Styles, Adam Alexis, Matthew Gogans, Batsuma, Serge Carmoro, Freeman Stephson, Brandon Dobbs, DB Kidrummer, Rainbow Cake, Vantam Tanta, Piotr Stalorch, Ninja Longnam, Infinite Drog, Dr. Jaden, Javier Diaz, Adam Root, Barb McKenley, But With Us, 7 Guys 777, Big Bob MG, Patrick Henning, Liquidy, e, Thanatos, Nesmoth, Joe Mann, Yellow Beans, Patrick Parks, Martin Newman, Jonathan Burgess, James Hazel, Harshit Singh, Ethan, Alexander G. Valencia, Lokanator, Travis Markley, Grinning Demon, Frank Show, The Foreign Sky, The Squires, I Ate My Neighbor, Utah Yasser, Christopher Tonkin, Gudulape Hernandez, Bam Bam, Kevin C, Yoda for Sale, Trunks 305 in KC, Michael Brown, Mark Rutledge, Amber Parrot, Jacob Herrer, Rick Mr. Joe, Victor William Beer, Kleiner Dackel, and Dr. Bosky. You guys are amazing. Thanks so much for watching. I thank you also. Your bed shoulders are bigger. <gasps> what is that? What is that? <laughs> More videos. <laughs> Did not work. <laughs> Did not work. Also, you can check out my Patreon link down below. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. And see you tomorrow.